Though it has never come across in the games, those of us familiar with the peripheral law, that is, law that we've discovered through the books and such, are aware that there is a fierce one-sided rivalry between the ODSTs and the Spartans. In truth, it is much, much more than that. ODSTs, particularly those of the 105th Division, arguably the most brutal and prideful division of the ODSTs, either dislike, distrust, or outright hate the Spartans. But for what reasons do the ODSTs hate them? And is their hate misplaced? Or is it fully justifiable and even warranted? Let's find out in today's Law and Theory. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and following some recent chats I've had with a few community members, it would appear that large swathes of my subscribers have not been seeing my recent content being pushed into their feeds. On top of this, I've actually hit 75,000 subscribers twice in recent weeks, indicating a glitch in YouTube having unsubscribed hundreds, if not a thousand or so people randomly, dropping me back to below the 75k mark to hit it all over again. Go figure. Couple this with the increase in the percentage of subscribed versus unsubscribed viewers I'm seeing on my analytics, it leads me to believe YouTube as a platform is having something of a midlife crisis. So while I feel a bit of an ass to have to ask, I feel I'd be doing my community a disservice to ignore it. So if you'd kindly just check that you are actually subscribed, even if you think that you already are, just in case, and if you've been unsubbed by YouTube in its infinite wisdom. Also let me know in the comments if you were so I can forward this to a YouTube community manager. And if you aren't subbed, consider jumping aboard and hitting the little bell icon so you don't miss my content in the future. That'd really mean the world to me. Thanks for sticking with me while I quickly address this point. It's always awkward, but in this case I think it was necessary. Now, all of that's out of the way, let's look into why ODSTs hate Spartans. Orbital drop shock troopers are somewhat famous among those of the United Nations Space Command for their tenacity in combat. As a part of the Naval Special Warfare Division of the UNSC, the ODSTs are special forces to the nth degree, and up until the arrival of the Spartans were the largest and most accomplished special forces division of the UNSC. They were the best of the best and were called upon to act in the most dire of situations. The orbital insertion method in which ODSTs are deployed often leads to the creation of an important distinguishing psychological characteristic commonly displayed among their ranks. Orbital drop shock troopers are very proud of their accomplishments and skills, having to go through a particularly vigorous, brutal and even aggressive training regime in order to qualify as an ODST, and although the position is purely voluntary, a person entering into ODST training and then dropping out and returning to their original post is a shameful situation to the point that death is considered a mild inconvenience. Many ODSTs believe they uphold a commando state of mind, meaning they can do anything with the right attitude. Among their peers, ODSTs are often jovial and almost carefree, however when an ODST is around someone who is not a member of their organisation, they often become stoic overtly unfriendly, and have a complete absence of any expression, though they still often remain relaxed. Many individuals have confidence that the ODSTs can do nearly anything they are tasked to do, no matter the difficulty of the assignment. It stands to reason, then, that when the Spartans arrived on the scene with their augmented physiology, superior training, and extraordinary Mjolnir-powered assault armour, this made large swathes of the ODST suddenly feel quite inferior. But there is more to it than a simple inferiority complex. After the Spartan II candidates went through their augmentations, forging them into the most powerful super soldiers humanity had ever seen, the Spartans were attached briefly to the UNSC Atlas, an Epoch class heavy carrier. John 117 entered the gym to train post augmentation. Due to his enhanced strength and speed, the weights he was accustomed to felt much too light. After experimenting with adding weight and moving to the higher gravity portion of the gym, 
John performed a simple calculation to decide if the gravity generation in the gym was functioning correctly, in a bid to try to make sense of why nothing in the gym felt right. He used the locking pin from some weights to test the gravity by dropping it and measuring the time it took to fall to the deck, then factoring in some basic calculations to ascertain if the gravity was correct. It was at this point that four ODSTs entered the gym and went to work out. The biggest ODST began using the weights John had removed the pin of. When the weights fell off the bar and nearly crushed the foot of the man's spotter, John approached and apologised for his mistake. The ODST surrounded the 14-year-old John and threatened to make him eat the pin. Before the situation escalated to that, the ODST sergeant entered the gym and ordered them into the boxing ring to work it out. ODSTs of the 105th were not unfamiliar with this kind of conflict resolution, although it is a point of debate as to whether or not four fully grown, battle-hardened ODSTs should have acted so aggressively towards what was obviously a 14-year-old boy. Nevertheless, John slipped between the ropes and waited for the ODSTs. In the following five seconds, John inadvertently killed two of the ODSTs and heavily wounded a third. In the words of ODST Anthony Petrosky, a person who witnessed these events play out, the fight between the trained ODSTs and a single 14-year-old boy was comparable to lambs to the slaughter. John hit so hard and so fast the ODSTs could barely react. John struck one of the ODSTs in a body blow that stopped his heart instantly. The second, John punched once to the face, which caved in his skull. The third, John kicked and shattered his pelvis, and the final one, he fractured his spine, paralyzing him for the rest of his life. The lives of these ODSTs were ended or changed forever in five seconds of hand-to-hand -hand combat with a freshly augmented Spartan II. At this point, John's commanding officer, Chief Mendez, entered the gym and told John to stand down and the ODST sergeant to step outside to be debriefed. News of this engagement spread across the ODSTs rapidly and galvanized into a long living resentment of the Spartans arguing that four ODSTs were needlessly killed at the hands of a freak. As with most stories, John's side of the events told a different story, but this was conveniently ignored. The fact that four ODSTs were ordered to fight a 14-year-old boy was completely overlooked but there was something else going on too. The Office of Naval Intelligence, whom were an interested party in the Spartans' development and training, had orchestrated the entire event to test a Spartan's capabilities immediately after augmentation. However, due to the classified nature of this information, this was also not known to the ODSTs, leaving the rivalry to be seeded and perpetuated across the numerous divisions of Helljumpers within the UNSC with the story likely becoming more and more jaded over time, glossing over mitigating factors and extraneous detail in favour of the simple message, one single Spartan attacked, injured and killed four ODSTs for no reason. Who is in the wrong here? The ODSTs were in the wrong for engaging a 14-year-old boy to start with. Yes, they were given orders to fight that 14-year-old boy, but at what point does the duty of a soldier urge him to refuse an order that puts somebody vulnerable at risk. Admittedly, John was anything but vulnerable at that time, but the ODSTs didn't know that, and as such should have considered the situation a little more before just blindly following the order. Oni were in the wrong for orchestrating the situation to start with, and while some argument could be made to the contrary, John, at that age, knew the difference between neutralise a threat and kill. While admittedly he probably wasn't completely ready for how strong and fast he was post-augmentation, there were other ways John could have engaged the four ODSTs to neutralise the threat of harm to himself, while also sparing the ODSTs life. Dislocated elbows, broken wrists and fractured limbs are much easier to recover from while not being a life-altering injury or a death sentence. So in this regard, all three parties involved have some degree of blame, but this was the event which seeded the resentment. The then second lieutenant, Antonio Silva, who was assigned to the command of the very platoon of ODSTs who were ordered to fight John, 
would go on to become a major of the ODSTs, and was likely an integral point of propagation of the hatred of the Spartans, being exposed to their brutal abilities early on in his command career, and carrying and spreading that hatred through the years all the way up to his death on Installation 04 in 2552. But Silva was not the first, last, or only person of influence who took a grievance with the Spartans. So the animosity was seeded here, but it also didn't end here. Through the years, as news of the Spartans and their actions across multiple battles during the Human Covenant War, fueled by propaganda spread by Oni in an effort to boost morale across UNSC forces in the face of a losing war, the ODST's infamy was supplanted by the Spartans, with the Spartans achieving something akin to a godlike hero status across the civilian populations and an awestruck celebrity status within the UNSC, the ODST's prideful mannerisms were tarnished and overshadowed by the impossible standards of the Spartans. Even while ODSTs were serving, fighting, and dying in their hundreds on the battlefronts across human-controlled space, news of the Spartans and their success would overshadow any accomplishments and sacrifices of the ODSTs, with their brothers and sisters in arms' names being utterly unknown and forgotten by the very populations they fought and died to protect. I have to admit, were I in the same position where countless numbers of my brothers and sisters in arms were dying to protect humanity, and yet their sacrifices were completely ignored in favour of the actions of a few inhuman augmented super soldier freaks, I'd be pretty pissed off too. Even in our modern world society, we try to remember the lives of people who fought and died for the freedoms enjoyed by so many. In the Western world, every single year, we remember the countless soldiers who paid the ultimate price to secure our freedom in battles that took place decades ago. Imagine the anger, disappointment and fury you would feel as a soldier fighting in a war at that exact time where your brothers and sisters in arms had died for the cause and not one of their names was mentioned, instead completely supplanted by the simple word Spartan, completely ignored and overshadowed. It doesn't bear thinking about. But alas, back to the other person of influence. Colonel James Ackerson of the UNSC Army, and later the Office of Naval Intelligence, was a man of ambition and scope. His resentment of the Spartans is less clear-cut, being a man with the sight to develop his own super-soldier program within the Army, and leveraging himself a position on the UNSC Security Council and Special Weapons Development Program within UNSC High Command. His projects were often in competition with Dr. Catherine Halsey's projects for funding, in this regard, Ackerson's resentment of the Spartans and Dr. Halsey was a symptom of this competition and born of a need for flow of revenue. Being the driving force behind the Spartan 3 program, this made things significantly more complex. There were ideological differences in the two programs in the first instance. He conducted extensive research on Dr. Halsey's work with the Spartan 2 program illegally obtaining DNA profiles of the candidates and covertly observing the Flash clones used to replace the Spartan 2 children. He even had the clones' bodies retrieved and autopsies performed on them after they died of congenital diseases. However, he would ultimately abandon the use of Flash clone replacements in his own program, citing the dubious ethics of Flash cloning as one of the failures of Halsey's program when presenting his own project to Oni. This didn't particularly score him many points in regards of ethics, as the Spartan 3 program still used children aged 4 to 6 as candidates, orphans of the war, whose parents were killed by the Covenant War Machine, and involved the covert kidnap of Spartan 2 Kurt 051 to train the new generation of Spartans. But not using Flash clones, was apparently significant enough of a point of discussion to bar to himself some degree of favour from the Oni board. 
that and the massive reduction in cost per unit. But how does Ackerson's involvement affect the ODSTs and their disdain for the Spartans? In August of 2552, the now Master Chief Petty Officer, John 117, was outfitted with Mjolnir Mark V armor and given the AI Cortana at Military Reservation 01478-B. During a field test involving the pairing of John 117's Mark V armor with Cortana, Ackerson tried to kill the Spartan. He attempted this when he authorized the use of Lotus anti-tank mines, three 30mm chain guns, an airstrike by a Skyhawk fighter against the Spartan, and the deployment of a squad of fully armed and armored orbital drop shock troopers using live ammunition and with orders to kill on sight. In the ensuing conflict, John dislocated the shoulder and broke the ribs of the first of the ten ODSTs, knocking him unconscious. The second he hit with the butt of his rifle, breaking several vertebrae in his neck. He broke the third's leg so severely the bone burst through the skin, and then knocked him unconscious with a blow to the head. He swept the legs out of the next three ODSTs with a tent pole with such force he broke all of their legs. The next he threw the tent pole out like a javelin, which struck the ODST in their sternum, cracking his sternum and collapsing his lung. That was the seventh ODST he dealt with. The eighth he struck in the chest, breaking all of his ribs and puncturing his lungs, causing him to collapse. The ninth he shot their knees out, and the tenth he simply punched in their helmeted head. He didn't kill any of them, but seriously injured them all. And he did all of that in 22 seconds. Ackerson's decision to involve ODSTs in this situation again only fueled the building resentment between ODSTs and Spartans. Ackerson's intent was to either disgrace the Spartan twos and Dr. Halsey, and if possible to kill the most well-known Spartan alive. Nevertheless, John succeeded, and Cortana sought revenge by wreaking havoc in Ackerson's private files, hacking into his personal computer and sending notes requesting reassignment to frontline service, as well as sending a large amount of money from his account to a brothel in Gilgamesh, and sending the bill to his home where his wife would find it. Somehow he managed to exonerate himself, but this didn't change that more ODSTs had fallen victim to a Spartan's furiosity. At this time, these are the most significant of situations that have played into the ODST's resentment of the Spartans. Some we knew about already, the training incident in the gym being one of them, but the ideological differences the competition for revenue, the different modus operandi of the respective divisions of special forces, public opinion and perception of the ODSTs versus the Spartans, the ignorance of sacrifices made in service to humanity. Admittedly, the Spartans couldn't control all of these circumstances, and there may be many more we simply don't know about yet that all added to their growing resentment. In more recent times, the Spartan 4 program has proliferated the relative ease of access into a super soldier program to levels comparable to volunteering for the ODSTs. In many ways, the Spartan 4s have made ODSTs nearly redundant, and in similar fashion to previous statements, the nomenclature of the Spartan 4s being Spartans means you would expect the same levels of disdain to carry over to the Spartan 3s and 4s, but thus far, it appears to be a wholly unique problem with the Spartan 2s, respectively. It's worth noting, while many ODSTs have been offered and moved over to become Spartan 4s, the vast majority of ODSTs remain as ODSTs, and in a battle setting, they will not hesitate to work with, fight alongside, and take orders from a Spartan. In most circumstances, in fact, ODSTs are glad to see Spartans in the battlefield. However, it appears like this is mainly due to professional courtesy, and that generally speaking, when soldiers are actually in a combat zone, they are not fighting for their country, their species, their branch, their division, their commanding officer, or even themselves. They're fighting for the men and women they are stood next to. In a combat setting, this includes 
seven foot tall armored killing machines. In a combat setting, Spartans and ODSTs get things done in a way that very, very few can. But this too doesn't change the differences they have off the battlefield. It doesn't wipe clean the blood that has been spilled by Spartan hands. It doesn't change the lives that have been ended or changed forever by Spartans acting under orders. It doesn't change the countless ODSTs who have died in the war in service to humanity that have been ignored and forgotten in the shadow of the name Spartan 117. It doesn't change the backroom politics between people of influence working in favour for or opposition against Spartan operations or the never-ending pursuit of financial backing for military projects or competing interests of the top brass and the Office of Naval Intelligence. A dozen or more factors go into the resentment between ODSTs and Spartans. And while it is a one-sided resentment, with the Spartans bearing no ill will towards the ODSTs, that doesn't mean that the ODSTs are in the wrong. In truth, their anger, their hatred, and their resentment is completely and utterly valid. It is fully justified and inarguable. But it may also be slightly misplaced. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I really look forward to what you have to say on this one. This one's quite a controversial kind of subject and I'm, I'm looking forward to your opinions. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and YouTube members. Neek the Silent Cartographer, Kyle Stevens and Siphonic Storm, my tier 0 transcendience, Brian, Red Sea, Darian, Stork of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, Mr. Fell, Flaming Halo, the Revanche, Starlight, Legions Lost, Josh, the TG7, TJ Jazz, Cat Herder, Cam, Schneidish, Leon, Fellow Individual, and Ignizzle, the Holders of the Mantle, my Glorious Reclaimers, my most loyal of Metarchs, and all the other patrons and members that have jumped aboard to support the channel. Much love to you guys, thanks so much for your support, it's keeping things happening and helping the development of the channel and future awesomeness in a big, big way. If you like Halo Lore Discuss to Insane Loves of Detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord. And if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there or jumping on as a channel member. It would mean the world to me and afford you loads of great perks and bonuses while also helping work towards some awesome stuff in the near and distant future. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.